All right, Shane. Hello. Shane, oh, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Uh, I'm from uh, South Hill in Limerick, Ireland. Um, I grew up there. I was born in 1987 and um, I moved to New York in 2012. Um, South Hill was the is a ghetto inside what was at the time the murder capital of Europe. Um, I got to uh, preface this every time I talk about South Hill, though. It's like there are good like South Hill. There are amazing people there. You know, I grew up around some great people and now it's it's um, much more like it's not as crime ridden and it's it's a great place and people don't really like constantly hearing the term stab city and all that kind of stuff. But uh, when I grew up there, it was an absolute shithole, just like an absolute uh, hellscape, pretty much. I was in like one of the roughest areas between two uh, feuding drug gangs. So uh, we would, you know, I would wake up every morning. And on top of that, then there was like a joyriding issue in the neighborhood. So people would steal cars, burn them out and leave them in the field outside our house. And, um, uh, you know, like you, you'd wake up in the morning, you'd go, you'd go out, there'd be like a freshly burned car. And then uh, you'd try and not get mugged on the way to school. And then that night you might see guys fighting or something crazy happening like that. And uh, I was there for, I was there up until I was like 13. Um, I, th I think it was about... 10 years old and I was walking home from school once and I saw a guy put his hoodie up, block his face and take out a box cutter and uh, attack one of my neighbors and they were sc scurrying for a while, trying to, he was trying to get the guy off him. And uh, I was just sitting there like at, at 10, I didn't know what to do, I was just watching these guys and then uh, what should I call it, I just went in for dinner, I just went in, went in home, we didn't talk about it, you know, and that was kind of like a common thing. Um, these guys were, it was like an eye for an eye situation in the, in the, in the city at the time. I think it was like dr mainly drugs, but, um, it, it spiraled into like, uh, I don't know, like revenge a, a lot of the time. Um, and then like shortly after that, you know, I was home one night on my own. My house got broken into. I was like, I was like 10 or 11, I think. And uh, I heard someone running around upstairs and I thought my brother had like snuck in the back door. And uh, I remember going to the door, I was like holding my dog and I remember going to the door and be like, J like James, I was like calling my brother and uh, nothing. And then I, I sat back down inside. These two guys came running, I could hear them running down the stairs and the door opened into the living room and it was just darkness and I saw some guy there. And I was like, who's that? And then they ran out of the house. And uh, so I'm just like there on my own pretty much. Um, after that, you know, the house was set on fire a bunch of times. Our family car was set on fire. Um, and around this time, my parents divorced and uh, my mom had a lot of mental health issues um, at the time. I, I mean, I don't want to like air all her shit, but, you know, she had she was struggling with alcohol, alcoholism and stuff like that. So it was quite we were stuck there for quite a while. The last like few years we were there, it, it kind of got a little bit more peaceful. But uh, we, my dad had built like a makeshift glass house onto the front of the house. And uh, kids would just throw stones all day. So my mom just had like this crazy anxiety uh, all the time and like bad depression, alcoholism. And we'd just be sitting down eating dinner and w bits of windows would be breaking. This was like going on for like two years or something like that. Um, but we eventually got out of there and moved to a quieter place. But um, that was kind of the foundation for me growing up. Um, and then there was some, in the neighborhood, there was some... Uh, I don't want to get into it too much, but there was some sexual abuse stuff that happened to me. And uh, so I had this like <laughs> beautiful cocktail of just absolute shit for the first 10 or 12 years uh, growing up. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm sure that impacted your adult life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I was always like a very anxious person. I, I mean, you know, some of it's genetics, some of it's um, surroundings, but like growing up, um, always just super anxious, like socially very awkward. And, um, but I was kind of doing okay once we moved out of there for a while. Um, um, be just before we moved out of there, my dad was a politician in, um, in Limerick, Ireland and, uh, you know, like small, small city. Um, we didn't have any money or anything like that, but he became mayor for, you know, it's like a year term there. And I remember the way we found out that my parents were splitting up was the local newspaper had seen him with someone else and they put it on like the front page. So me and my mom walked down to the shop one morning and she found out she was there, like all the neighbors who knew, knew her and stuff. She just looked at the newspaper and like they were looking at her. And I remember that's how she found out. And uh, we just walked back home with the newspaper and uh, they they started the slow process of um, of divorcing. But yeah, after that, it was it was kind of OK. But when I got to art school, that's when anxiety and drugs uh, 
experimenting with drugs and all that kind of stuff kind of came to the fore. Um, and then I was always like super angry at my mom because I couldn't understand why she just like wasn't happy, like why we could be finally doing something good and she would just nosedive. She would just, her mood would completely change. And like growing up, I, I just like I was, I was aside from all the stuff that happened, I was like a relatively optimistic person, like kind of, uh, you know, I could always like find the good in a, in a shitty situation. And I thought, I thought she was like faking it for so long. I thought she was um, kind of lying to us or just fucking with us or something. And I, I like for most like of my early life growing up, I thought depression wasn't real. I thought anxiety wasn't real. I thought mental health was just like something you could snap out of. But then it happened to me in art school. I just kind of um, had, uh, had like a relationship that was really intense. And when it ended, I, uh, I just like nosedived. Uh, something switched in my brain, it, like felt like my brain broke and everything just caught up to me. And uh, I, I had, I guess, something close to like a mental breakdown and I had to get, get a lot of help. Um, but uh, and then since since art school to now, I'm like 34 now. So that was when I was about 20 or something. You know, it's been like a long uh, recovery period, trying to like figure shit out and get healthy mentally, I guess. But in those years, I've completely like reassessed how I see my mom. Like I see her more as like a victim now. She was there was there was like nothing she could do about her state of mind. And the more I learned about her growing up, like I. I, I don't know the full details, but like there was something there with the Catholic Church and priests. Like Ireland is terrible for that kind of shit. Like there's a lot, a lot of abusive uh, clergymen and stuff over there. And I know something fucked up happened to her in her youth. Um, and uh, and then she, I mean, she had like ECT and stuff for her. Like like it was like the the, the services or whatever the mental health services in the country in the like 60s 70s and 80s was not good like electroconvulsive therapy was like a thing you do and, like i would visit her in psychiatric wards and stuff when i was a kid and uh i just never got it but but then i got a taste of it for myself and um my relationship with her was always very contentious but in recent years it's been it's been a lot healthier and um i just feel i just feel bad for her now you know and uh, kind of amazed by her that she survived it all. She also just like, she decided to just, she was like an alcoholic and a sm she would like smoke 60 cigarettes a day and she just stopped both those things one day. Like no recovery rooms or anything like that, she just completely stopped. And uh, she was do she was drinking like while she was on all this antipsychotic medication and stuff. So she could have really, really been much worse off. But um, it's kind of amazing that she's, she's still here and she's like the happiest, she's like 70 or approaching like mid 70s now and she's like, the happiest I've ever known her, which is which is really sweet. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And you came to the states. Yeah, I, I came to the states in 2012. Um, so I was in art school, um, and I, we were lucky enough to have a visit to New York. And of, like the whole, like if you're an artist or a musician, the whole of Ireland is like uh, one small town. Like everyone knows everyone, you know, and it's very insular and very tiny. And uh, we came to the states for a visit with the with the school, and um, I, I was just like, when I saw New York, I was like, I'm just going to try and fucking move there. Um, and after school, I took a graduate visa to move there, which gets you a year in the country. I like knew no one. I had like, I think I managed to get like $2,000 in my bank account and just landed in New York. I had also just started uh, antidepressants and, and anxiety medication at that time. So it was like, oh, you're anxious, like make it way worse by moving to New York. Um, but uh, so I, I got here, eventually got set up slowly. Um, I, w I wanted to move here because, um, you know, I just grew up on all that stuff, like all the the New York music scene, the the noise stuff, the um, the the art scene, the, the um, Lower East Side art scene and all that. So all that stuff was like super inspiring to me. So um, I moved here and but the first five years were just a write off. Like it was just um, it was just like mental health ups and downs, accommodation. Like I remember like my first morning in my first apartment, I woke up with a cockroach on my face. It was, I was like sleeping in a kitchen. That was the first place I rented. Um, just the usual like rites of passage, I guess, for New York. Um, but, uh, you know, th things are much better now. Um, but when I got here, the thing that really flared for me and it had become kind of a crutch, I guess, back in Ireland was, um, it was slowly like porn addiction that morphed into sex addiction. And um, that kind of took over my life for a while. Like that's how I dealt with all the, all the crap that was going on and all the stress. Um, again, that was a thing I like didn't think existed. You know, I was just like, that's such a stupid thing. Like, how could you be addicted to sex? Like everyone is. Um, 
but there's nothing wrong with you know like being you know doing whatever you're doing but when it gets to the point where you're like not enjoying it anymore it's just like an itch you have to scratch you're like putting yourself in danger you're going to like really dodgy places hang out with really dodgy people you're not even attracted to you know uh it starts to get um a bit rough and uh yeah that kind of went on pretty hard for a few years um but I, I met some good people in New York who had some of the same issues and um, uh, sorting that, the addictive side of my personality out has been um, very helpful in getting some of the mental health stuff on track. Um, so yeah, New York is a, is a insane place. Like I love it and I hate it in equal measure, um, but there's no, there's no place like it. And I, I'm kind of glad I stuck it out for the last 10 years, so yeah. What's your favorite thing about New York? just the atmosphere man like you can just walk just a few streets for a while and you'll see something weird it's i mean it's kind of like here i guess you know um it's it just has an, an atmosphere and an energy that you can't get anywhere else and like if you're like me if you're a musician if you wanted to just start a band tomorrow you just put an ad on craigslist and you'll have five people to jam with or something like that yeah, new york is great yeah it's um it's a good spot there's no place like it like you said yeah yeah and uh how old are you now I'm 35 now. 35. Yeah. Relationships? Yeah, I'm married now. Um, yeah, for, for me, the the addictive stuff, I guess it was, um, quote unquote, like sex and love addiction is what they call it in the rooms. Um, again, I, I, thought, I was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard um, when I first heard it. But for me, you know, I was just like uh, going from relationship to relationship and it was always so tumultuous and like so intense. And um, I had to like, I had to um, stop doing that for a long time and reassess a lot of that stuff and watch what I was, just watch the brain uh, doing what it does when I see someone new and like attach myself to them like super hard. Um, but in the last uh, three or four years I got married and um, there was something about like committing to someone that really helped nullify all that constant like crippling like paralysis by options I guess and that constant like um, uh, hunger for like novelty or whatever it is like um, it sounds kind of cheesy but like my, my friend said it before he's like the best drug in the world is like sleeping with strangers you know it's like well, it's, I've heard a lot of people say that like aren't we all sex or love addicts right yeah and what, what is the difference between being in a committed relationship with your wife and living the life that you were you're calling sex addiction um, I think that when 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 I when I was caught like in in that like sex addicted mindset um, like my whole life revolved around it like I would like you know like you're on like as many profiles as possible to like f you're like fishing for people all day you're what like are you, what are you looking for you're looking for any you're looking for someone who's wild I guess you're looking for someone who has is as it, little shame it, as you do is it the adrenaline it's the, first of all it's the adrenaline when you when you meet someone new you don't know where you're going you're in the new house you it's like uh seeing a person for like two minutes before you're naked with them you know there's something like very like just a huge adrenaline rush but then i think probably like the real part of it is like the afterwards where you're like kind of like relaxed and close to someone the intimacy i guess it's like a shortcut to intimacy it's like the adrenaline and the intimacy and um it's wanting to get that without putting in any of the real effort or maybe not effort, but like uh, it's like a shortcut to that, mainlining that, I guess, mm -hmm. and doing it over and over again. You know, I mean, I would feel like, you know, like I always I always uh, I grew up like I just hate the way I look and I always like very socially awkward and stuff. So like the fact that, you know, in my 20s, I could like like I slept with like 10 people this week, like that made me feel like I was somebody. You or hate the way you like look. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still? Yeah, uh, it's getting better as I get older. I'm just giving less of a shit, I guess. I don't think I'm liking it more. I, I, think, I think when people are young, yeah, in their 20s perhaps, they struggle with that. Yeah. yeah. And as, as they age, they, you, you kind of start liking yourself more or accepting yourself more. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, a, you're just, you hit with this onslaught of... Because you're a handsome young man, and I would, I would say, like, why, why do you not like it the way you look? Oh, that's very sweet of you to say, but yeah, I, I don't know... Uh, I don't know, maybe it's watching too much American TV growing up, I'm not sure, but everyone, well, everyone that, here is so beautiful. Social media and, and yeah. American TV are terrible for that. Yeah. But like I went bald when I was like, um, I guess the, we should give an example, but I went bald <laughs> when I was like, I started noticing it around 16 or 17. Your, your you know? beard makes up for it though. Right, cheers, yeah, yeah, that helps. And yeah, just stuff like that. Like I, like uh, when I went to art school, I got into that, re that really intense first relationship. Like she was so gorgeous. Like I couldn't believe someone that attractive would be interested in me, you know? 
Um, it was just like very like, I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, I didn't know it was, I was allowed to experience this kind of thing. And then I kind of was chasing that ever since. I think like self-worth was completely tied to being able to be side by side with a with a like a attractive woman or something like that. Um, and I was just in that for years. But like when you, you know, you do that for so long, eventually you hear a voice in the back of your head being like, dude, you're like, what what is this? Like you're you're constantly chasing this thing. You're like losing jobs because of it. You're like fucking up relationships with people, you know, and stuff. And uh, that you can you can choose to like listen to that voice and see what it's saying to you or you can just um, keep going down the tunnel, I guess. Um, like for me, it would like with with porn like I, and sex, like I would I would do it until I was bleeding. I would not care about what like uh, STDs I got, you know. I would really worry about it. I would care about the other person. I definitely didn't want to pass anything on to them. But like once I got the all clear again, I would just start the cycle again over and over again. And uh, it, it just it, it started getting physically dangerous. Like I, I was I was in some really rough parts of town with people who were just out of their minds on drugs. And uh, and eventually it just got to a point where I was like, ah, this is not going to end well. So yeah. what do you think it stems from? Um, I, I don't know. I could like theorize that it's something to have to do with like a, having an unstable mother or something like that. Like um, my my dad, I, like I love my dad so much. Very intelligent guy. I'm so lucky to have had him in my life. Um, but he was emotionally like uh, colder. I, I don't mean that in a bad way. He just he's just straight and stern Irish father, I guess. And my mom was like the opposite. She was like just like very physical and like overly doting on me and stuff like that. So it was just like borderline back and forth. But um, Something in something in that I guess like knocked off my um, picker, as they say. Um, You're happy now. I'm much happier now. Um, yeah, like I, I part part of the main reason I wanted to like come on here and talk is that like uh, like I feel like I you know I there's no like totting this up against like what other people are feeling or whatever, but I I feel like in general like you know I've been in like the worst of the worst mental health situation in the sense that like uh you know i'm a person who would never in my life want to ki like kill myself or commit suicide or anything like that but it got so bad that like that felt like like i just wanted the pain to stop i've been in psychiatric hospitals i was convinced that like uh you know depression can't be fixed like there's no way out of this shit you're just stuck with it for the rest of your life but um like and I hate it just sounds cheesy and I hate saying this kind of shit but with some work you can really improve your situation you know you can't like it's horrible nasty boring fucking work but um I, I look at my life uh around art school and moving to New York in those years and maybe some of my earlier years and like how bleak and just fucking awful it was and I look at it now and I'm just like it can be fucking done like and I just wanted wanted to say that like um, if I can do it, someone else can do it. Like, you know, I, you know, I've spent just, I just, it's hard to talk about it, like without making it sound like a fucking sob story, but like, you know, like I've spent so much time just like away from people convinced that like my life would just be in a room, you know, and that I couldn't interact with people ever again. Um, you know, I, I assumed that my life was just going to be heavy medication forever and I would just be totally fucked. And like, I'd be lucky if I could create any art or talk to any people. But, um, but just with the help of friends and with, with like the willingness to try and make things slowly better day by day, to like call yourself out in your bullshit, um, to, to even though things are fucked up, to like look for some optimism in life um, and just working at that constantly, like having the desire to actually uh, make things improve and like, you know, try and envision a life that might actually not fucking suck all the time. You can slowly get there over time, and I know it's much harder. Um, it's, it's, it's easier for me to say, I guess, because I maybe I'm lucky enough to have like the gumption to like force it to happen or whatever. I know it's different for people who are on the street and they're just stuck in a, a cycle of like addiction and um, and just no resources whatsoever. But um, but I do believe if you get some like good help and uh, you 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 just keep working at it, even when you like get fucked up again and just constantly relapse or whatever, if you just try and um, stay on it constantly keep trying to push back against it you know like progress can be made maybe you'll not be fucking 100 perfect but there's a huge difference between like being completely fucked and like having just a non-life to like like i'm married now i have two fucking cats you know i fucking 
I love my routine. I love fucking just doing the same fucking thing every day, you know, and I'm so grateful that I have a fucking apartment with a roof over my head, you know. Like, I don't miss being homeless in New York, you know. What, what do you do for work now? Uh, I work in a museum in the in the Long Island City. Um, I just give, I just do ticket taking and I tell people about some stuff. It's like a, Is there something in your life that you're passionate about, your art? Yeah, m music. Um, I'm like, music has been the thing that's always been a constant for me. It's, it's like, I'm a, a visual artist too, but music is the thing I'm super passionate about. When I was like 14, I think, uh, this band called Fugazi came to our shitty little hometown, <laughs> like in Ireland. We were like, you know, back then we were like, there's Americans in our hometown, so we have to go to the show. I had no idea who they were. Like, I'd never been to a live rock show in my life. And I remember like standing outside the venue and I could hear them sound checking the kick drum in the venue and it was like reverberating in my chest outside. And I was like, I was like scared. I was like, what's gonna happen? And we all went in there and for people who don't know, Fugazi are like a DIY kind of straight edge-ish punk band who just like are very, they talk very frankly to the audience about like life and stuff like that. But the next day we all just like form bands. Like every friend I knew, we all formed bands the next day. And that was like a complete lifeline for me. Um, I was talking to you a little bit um, in the coming month in the recent months because I'm on tour at the moment. Like I moved to New York in 2012. I stayed pretty much in New York for the last 10 years. I've seen none of this country. And we're now touring uh, DIY, like a DIY tour. We booked it ourselves, just playing small venues. And we're going along the south. All, we just made it to the East Coast, uh, we're on the West Coast, yeah, we just made it here, and we're gonna go up to Seattle and along the top and back to New York. It's a big loop, it's like 10,000 miles, and um, uh, it's been a crazy experience. Um, like, it's it's been life-changing. Um, like, I wouldn't have been able to do this like three years ago, let alone like five or eight years ago. Um, but yeah, um, uh, music and art has just been super important for me. It's like... Uh, being, being happy and healthy mentally is, is, is the key to a lot of it is, man. It is like fulfillment I, in life, right? I could, I could, I, I had, you know, I'm always, I've always been engaged in, in creating art and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do so much more now being in a better mental health space than, than I could when I was the quote unquote tortured artist. Like that was just hell pretty much all. Like you make work in spite of that stuff. Um, but, uh, but now it's like, I feel like I'm making up for lost time. Like, a few nights ago, we played Slab City, this off-the-grid community in the desert. Like, yeah. I was just like, like, I've never been in the desert before. Like, I'm from Ireland, so, like, I've never been in a fuck. I, I was just, like, standing there looking at the fucking desert, looking at these people, like, and I was just like, oh, man, this is, this has been worth it. This is made up, like, made up for a lot. Um, I just want to quickly say, too, like, um, you know, growing up, like, we all, like, were, like, like, America's so exotic. It's, like, the land of, like, uh, you know, like, opportunity or whatever. And, um... You know, nowadays, like the the opinion, I guess, is a little more negative on America, like um, be it true politics or whatever like that. And everyone's like, fuck America and all this shit. But like the thing that kills me, and I don't get it, is like, OK, like say you hate half the people in America. Fair enough. That's like a lot, what, a lot of us seem to do that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's like, what, one hundred and seventy five thousand million or I don't know. There's still so you so. Are all the other people sucky too? Does that make America terrible? That's still like millions of people who are we all, made, who we great. All have to hate ourselves. Yeah, right, right. And then on top of that, it's like the fucking geography in this country. It's so gorgeous. It's so beautiful. beautiful. The atmosphere is in the city. Like I fucking like, it's a it's a it's horrible that it's like a controversial. And like I'm on the left, but it, like it's a it's a controversial thing to say. Like I fucking love America. It's fucking gorgeous. I'm not country. like make America great. I'm not like whatever whatever you want to apply to me from just saying that sentence. But like. There's amazing people here, like the, the history, the, the pop cultural history is just insane. The art and the music that has come from this country is not so for me, like growing up, like I, I'm raised on like American movies and all that stuff. And um, I just it's just fucking depressing how at each other's throats everyone is here. And it's like you just talk to people one on one and people are just generally fine, you know. Some are boring, some are great, some are horrible, but like in, gen in general, like that's the thing, we just make these huge generalizations about massive swaths of people and that's progress right now, <laughs> you know? Well, there's, there's everything here. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's sad that we're at each other's throats so often. Yeah. yeah, and like, yeah, so there's everything here and there's the potential for so much greatness here, like so much beauty and camaraderie and stuff like that and it's just being floundered. An and, opportunity. Yeah, an opportunity. Exactly. You, you couldn't, what's the name of your band? Uh, Cinemartyr. It's like cinema and martyr, like someone who dies for their religion, put together. Cinemartyr. How do you spell it? C I N E M A R T Y R. My fucking Irish accent comes out when I oh, say it. Martyr. Mar martyr, yeah. Martyr. Yeah. I gotta say it like an American. Cinemartyr. <laughs> Cinemartyr. Martyr.
Yeah, I've been saying it to people on this tour the whole time, and they're like, marcher, like a marching band, but yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you play in your band? Uh, I play guitar. Um, I've been playing guitar since I was about uh, 12 or 13, I guess. And um, my motivation with guitar is to like make it not sound like a guitar. So it's run through some weird effects, and then we play what is called, I guess is termed math rock. The, the count is off, so it's like a weird count. And um, just... Uh, it, like, you know, my life is pretty structured outside of all this. So when I go on stage, that's like fucking freedom time. And like, we've been joking. It's called, uh, it's, we're calling it Stab Rock. You know, we have a song called Stab City. I'm from quote unquote Stab City. So that's a, kind of a through line with that because it's very, you know, it's like is the rest of your band story. Irish? Hmm? Is the rest of your band Irish? No, it's uh, uh, Amber, the singer, is from Nebraska. Um, Dave is from, the drummer is from New Jersey. And then Aaron is from Brooklyn. Uh, so we're a bit of a hodgepodge. But yeah. yeah. Excellent. Fun traveling the country it's been beautiful man uh well, I, i'm not gonna lie uh like i love my routine and what i got at home so the first three days like we're we're like a very energetic live band like we just throw it out there for the 40 minutes we have and so you know we're used to doing that like one or two nights a, a month in new york but this was like the first uh leg of this was like six nights in a row so like four nights in, i was like i'm good to go home like i get touring now i'm, I'm good to i'm good to leave it but it was just like a, f a fleeting thought and uh I'm so glad I stuck around because it's it's been fucking amazing just to see weird pockets of this country and like pe just random strangers putting us up in their living rooms and stuff like that. Um, it's just been so nice and I think I'll have a lot to think about when I get home and uh, process all this. But uh, we're in the we're at the halfway point now and we we got a lot more to do. But um, it's just it's just been fun living in a, a van with four other people and it's like we haven't killed each other yet. You know, it's and your wife is American. Uh, she's from the Philippines originally. Oh, Philippines. Yeah, and she uh, she moved here when she was about 13. Um, and she's a great photographer. She's a fine art photographer. Her day job is uh, copyright, but um, I, I just love her so much. Uh, since we've met, my life has just become better. Um, just having that like grounding force. Uh, or that, that, that's what you want that with a partner. Base. Yeah. Someone yeah. who makes your life better. Yeah. I was scared of that, you know, like uh, with the, the constant need for like novelty and... Um, yeah, like to anyone who's watching this, like if you have some of those like addictive uh, relationship traits, like I was very scared to meet someone who would be like stable. I was like, life will be quote unquote like too normal or whatever. But that's just, I, I think for the most part, that's probably bullshit. Like, um, uh, there's like there's there's a lot of fear around like committing to someone. Or, I mean, committing to a life, I guess, like to, that that doesn't have all those like constant like searching for like shiny options on the outside. Um, but once you get over that hump of, of that fear, I think it, it ultimately is great. It, it gives you like more space in your life, I guess, you know, to just have a home base and have someone you can depend on, both of you can depend on each other. And then um, you can go out into the world and do your thing and come back. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I appreciate it a lot. It's great. Yeah. It's nice to see someone whose lives whose life has kind of, you've, you've healed a lot of your problems and, and you're past it and you're happier and you're healthier and yeah it's nice to see that yeah um i i really want like uh it's yeah it's kind of like hard to talk about because i don't want to like just like dwell on i don't want to like get, talk about all my shit and then be like look i'm fine now because it's it's not as simple as that but i but i know for a fact like progress with mental health is 100 percent possible like i just i know that that is doable and if you're struggling with um with something like try and try and make it better uh, for yourself don't do it because someone else told you to do it or don't do it to live up to like some other person's idea of what like your good mental health should be or how your life should look just take small steps to slowly start improving your like what you have um because it is it is possible to to well, improve well, i think we kind of touched on it earlier sometimes your brain chemistry ch changes as you age yeah yeah and who, who you were when you're a teenager in your in your 20s is different than who you are in your 30s or 40s or, or beyond. Yeah, 100%. And you mellow and you seem to like yourself more or yeah. accept yourself more, which makes you a better partner and yep. everything becomes easier and better as you age. Yeah, I, th I, I agree with that. And sometimes I, I think about that too. I'm like, how much of it is actually like, I mean, it's probably a bit of both. How much of it is like hard work and therapy and all that stuff? And how much of it is just that your brain eventually goes, we're in older mode now, things are fine. You know, like that, like that it slowly just changes no, over I, time. I feel bad for people who peak out in their high school years or, or 20s. Yeah. It's like, you know, ooh. It's like, cause I'm, I'm happier now than I ever was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I kicked myself. Like I was, I was 
maybe physically in my prime in my 20s or 30s, but I just mentally was not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We don't get we, we were not lucky enough to have that overlap, I guess. Yeah. But but I agree. Like, I mean, I'm so happy now. I feel like, you know, like I, I seems to be the same for you, but like I'm I'm the most prolific, most organized, most artistic I've ever been in my life. And I'm like, I, I could not have seen that when I was in the doldrums. Like I couldn't I I that wasn't even something I hoped for. I was just like, that's not a possibility. Um, and the other thing is, too, I would just say, like, um, uh, with um, with medication and stuff like that, like, I was on I was on Paxil for, like, uh, maybe eight years or something like that. And, um, you know, getting on medication is good when you can be good for you when you have, like, all, all of these issues. And it's important to, like, either choose medication or drugs, you know, not to mix them or alcohol or the medication, whatever is your crutch or whatever, or is your medicine, I would say. But um, over time, that became... Um, less beneficial to me than beneficial and it took me about four years to switch from one medication to the other and that has been a big improvement thing for me too are you um, currently on something i'm on lexapro now and a lower dose and then uh, uh seroquel as well which is normally an antipsychotic but it they use it as a it's like a clean drug they call it as a sedative for sleeping those, I, those are common i think yeah 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 um so i'm taking less of what I less milligrams, but like also a, a less side effects prone uh, drug, and um, it's just can't be stated enough that it's like really important that like if you if you feel like your doctors are off or just don't give a shit, like tr maybe try and look try out another one. Um, but the, the medication for me has like made a huge difference. Um, Have you tried to wean off of it? Uh, yeah, that's how I ended up in the psych ward uh, the first time. Yeah, uh, that, that shows you how important these things are. Yeah, how, how helpful they can be. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not. I'm you know to each their own. Like if you were doing fine with just smoking weed or whatever, that's fine. I don't I don't do any drugs or anything. But the medication has been very helpful for me. But I took I took like two months to wean myself off it very slowly, mm -hmm. and I was like that wasn't so bad. And uh, after about a week. Uh, I couldn't sleep. I slept. I didn't sleep for like a week. It was it was insane. I, I if I if I slept, it must have been for a fucking half hour. And your every thoughts night. get tremendously dark. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, everything got incredibly dark. Um, it was just it was like a, just being on a bad trip all day. And uh, yeah, I ended up in the hospital and uh, a couple of times. And um, that was it was. I mean, it was a massive learning experience. You know, it was fucking terrifying at the time. I was pretty convinced I was going to die, but. Um, and then I had to go back on that medication, which was a super bummer. Like you, you, I feel like for a lot of us who go on like these uh, antidepressant stuff, you're looking forward to the day where you can finally get off it and be normal again. And I was like, I was like, I'm working out, and like this is going to compensate for the medication not being in my system. But um, I just nosedived after that, and I had to go back on it again. A lot of it wasn't so much just me coming off the medication, but coming off it at the wrong time. I had a lot of stressors in my life, so you don't want to be rushing yourself off that. You want to get to a point where things are more stable and then come off it. So I've, I've been able to wean off it and onto the other medication almost without a hitch uh, about two years after that initial stint. So um, again, that's doable. I thought I was stuck on it for my life, but uh, a lot of it just has to do with, I think, with being cognizant of what's actually going on in your life. Like you hope to just be perfect and clean again and like a normal human in society without medication. But I've, got, I've also gotten to this point where I just don't care if I'm on it for the rest of my life anymore. It's fine. You know, it's like, there could be worse things. It's not a big deal. Um, but we'll see. I probably eventually will try and um, see again if I can live life without that stuff. But who knows? I don't, I don't really care if it happens or not. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Shane, that's an interesting little conversation we just had. Thank you for having me. You're an inter interesting man. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank you it. so much. Thanks, Mark. All right.